Good afternoon. Thank you for being here. We are thrilled that you're here on this very special day in the state of Minnesota. We know that you're here because you either knew or knew of or experienced some relationship with a woman who we have has become known as the woman of the century. Now, for those of us, particularly the school kids, that was the last century. But, <laughs> but we are thrilled that uh, you're all in our midst today and it's going to be a whirlwind program because you see on your chair that it's a pretty long list of politicians that are being asked <laughs> to just limit their comments to two or three minutes. So we'll see how that goes. So it's a glorious day in Minnesota. You saw on your way here, it's bright sunshine. It is uh, totally blue sky. It is the time when it is perfect in Minnesota for us to uh, honor a very special woman. Now, the very first opportunity we have to share with you is to make this an official day. So our first official, our first uh, educator, our first uh, coach, our first cheerleader is Governor Tim Walls. Governor. Thank you, Louise. Well, thank you, Louise, and, and thank you to all of you. It, uh, it just feels right to be in this space, in the people's house, as uh, Louise said, on this beautiful day, um, to be surrounded by young people, to be surrounded by educators and labor leaders, to be surrounded by the people who this place is for. And I think uh, as the teacher in me, as the parent in me, the social studies teacher, that here we are in 2022 and we get the opportunity to add to our history in this space of this incredible human being. Having the statue and the history of Nellie Stone Johnson in here the impact this will have on generations to come. The idea that this is a state that we need to tell our history, our inclusive and whole history of who we are. And to have this statue in this place to, as you heard, connect so many things that have made Minnesota great is a true honor. So my job today is again to listen to Louise, who said keep it short, um, but more importantly to thank um, Nellie Stones Johnson's family who's here to clearly understand that the state recognizes the state of Minnesota today was so enhanced and made so much better because of this incredible woman's life and the opportunity for us to make sure that future generations feel and understand that impact. So it's my privilege today to be able to proclaim today, November 21st, 2022, as Nellie Stone Johnson Day in the state of Minnesota. Louise? I'd now like to hand it over to, uh, to my partner in justice and uh, someone who I think Minnesota has seen carving her path in this state of making sure voices are lifted up. That's our incredible Lieutenant Governor Peggy Flanagan. I'm going to use this box. Thank you, Louise. Thank you, Governor, and I'm so excited to be here with all of you today. I know this has been a labor of love and has been a long time coming. What a way for us to honor the memory and the legacy and the many contributions to the state of Minnesota that Nellie Stone Johnson has made. This has led to a lot of thinking over the last four years about the impact our choices on the people and ideas commemorated in this building and out on the mall have on all of us. And it makes me all the more proud to say that today marks the culmination of the choice that Nellie Stone Johnson should be honored in this building in our house, in the people's house. 
In addition to the history that the governor shared, the statue itself brings a number of firsts of its own and is a big deal. It is the first new statue placed in our state capitol building in over 60 years. This is the first plaque, statue, or bust of a woman of color in the Capitol building. And it is a national first, the first statue authorized by government action of a black woman in any of our nation's state capitals. So this addition is a very long time in the making, and I am grateful for all of you who are here, all of your contributions, your generous contributions of time and funds to make this statue a reality. It really took the work of an incredible group of people that was sort of ever growing and tending to this to get us here today. So he is unable to join us today, but first I would like to recognize Tim Cleary, the sculptor whose work um, on the statue you will see shortly. Next, I would like to thank Paul Mandel. Paul Mandel, who prior to his retirement helped the statue toward completion as executive secretary of the CAT board. And Paul, I believe Louise has a token of appreciation also to present to you. Not just one, Paul. <laughs> Paul stuck with us through thick and thin in the beginning. Paul always uh, called us back together when we thought there, that wasn't possible. Paul always did the right thing to get to where we are today, got us started, got us along very far along the way, but then he had the audacity to retire. So we weren't at his retirement party, so we are adding today to his collection on his wall in his office at his home, Paul Mandel, Executive Secretary, Capital Area Architectural and Planning Board, thank you for 34 years of skill, diplomacy, dedication to the state of Minnesota, its capital building and grounds, Nellie Stone Johnson Statue Committee 2022. Yeah. And. No, wait, there's more. There's more. <laughs> we just can't let him go with something that hangs on the wall. This he can hang on his back. This is a t shirt that commemorates Minnesota statehood, 1858 to 1958, and here, oops, thank you. Here is a bag of, with the Minnesota seal to carry it all in, and we add our many, many thanks for your work and encouragement. There was some fabulous prizes in the middle of this presentation. No cars. Don't look under your seat. There's nothing there. Um, I would also like to note my appreciation for the work of our current excellent CAP Board Executive Secretary, Merritt Clapp Smith, and my fellow board members as well. Hi, Merritt. Thank you. I'm also grateful for Commissioner Roberts Davis and the team at the Department of Administration for all of their work uh, as well. And finally, I would like to recognize the statute committee, Peg Carpenter, Judy Olson, Representative Joe Mullery, uh, Tamara Tademe, Frank Vigiano, and Louise Sundin uh, as the chair. And the state appropriation in 2013 laid the bedrock to allow for this statue. Then your persistent fundraising efforts and the generosity of Minnesotans, especially Minnesota's unions and their members who helped bring us today's celebration. So thank you.
Now when our students are visiting the Capitol, they are going to see and learn about the legacy of Nellie and all she represents. They're going to see themselves reflected in the people's house in a way they haven't before. And my mom was supposed to be at the celebration today. I lost my mom on Friday. And she really wanted to be here. Because growing up, my mom went to Nellie's house after school. And we would bring, my mom would bring, she was an amazing seamstress, and would bring items that needed to be mended or repaired because we didn't have a lot. Um, my mom's family didn't have a lot growing up. And she knew Nellie as an organizer, but also as my grandma's dear friend who cared for her after school, who taught her so much. And today we are recognizing Nellie Stone as a woman who did so much for all of us. And if I may also just recognize my mom, who also is part of that legacy. Um, so thank you for this opportunity. Excuse me. Um, thank you for this opportunity and for every little girl to know that she has a place and space in this building in whatever role she chooses. <clears throat> So this statue comes from the people of Minnesota and will now be trusted into the care of the Minnesota Historical Society. I will now hand things over to Minnesota Historical Society Executive Committee member and past president Phyllis Goff who will share more on this. Thank you so much. As immediate past president of the Minnesota Historical Society's governing board, the executive council, I'm proud to be here to share with you our pride in being a part of this occasion. The Minnesota Historical Society's mission is to preserve and share the stories of all Minnesotans. So we are especially honored to be a part of this historic moment in our state's history. Under state law, the Historical Society is responsible for both the preservation and education at the Minnesota State Capitol. Therefore, we are pleased and proud to provide stewardship of this magnificent work of art on behalf of the people of Minnesota for the educational benefit of all Minnesotans who visit this amazing historic tribute in our state's historic Capitol building. I am personally proud and humbled and honored because I knew Nellie Stone Jansen and I looked up to her for her quiet but steady leadership, her strength, and her courage in fighting for workers and in fighting for the cause of equity and civil rights not only in this state but in the entire country. So on behalf of Kent Wentworth, the director and CEO of the Minnesota Historical Society, David Hakinson's, the board president, and the entire board and staff of the Minnesota Historical Society, we thank you. So we're all in this place today really because of one man, and it was his friendship with Nellie, it was his uh, knowledge of her life, it was his desire to memorialize her life, a life of activism, a life of commitment, a life of education, and it was a long journey for him. It's been a long journey for all of us, but most of all, it's been a long journey for the one who could conceive of this idea who uh, ushered it through, who kept his uh, nose to the grindstone, if you will, and he's the reason that we, and the person we have to thank for being here today, and he's our friend, 
Joe Mullery, former representative, Joe. Thank you all, and yes, it's been a while, and thank you, Louise. Um, and Louise knows me and how well I know Nellie, so she said, you're going to write out a script and stick to it because otherwise we'll be here for days and maybe weeks because you can tell Nellie stories forever. And the truth is, uh, Nellie was a person of great character, but she was also a real character. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I actually worked on this all day yesterday to cut it in half so I came in two minutes under what Louise gave me um, so we finally come together to celebrate and honor my close friend Nellie Stone Johnson who for a couple decades I've called probably the woman of the century in Minnesota because she accomplished so much for so many varieties of people people of color workers, union members, women, educators, farmers, the list goes on. And while she became a leader on extremely varied initiatives, she told me over and over that they all sprouted from her clarion call that, to quote her, what everyone needs is an equal opportunity to a good job, a good education, and a good job. If someone never heard that from her, they never got into a deep discussion of her basic <laughs> beliefs because she repeated it every time she talked to me about issues. Um, there were other issues for her, but she felt that most of them would be solved in the long run with good education and job. I started this project early in 1997 and thought it would be done in a year or two. <laughs> Instead, it's been two months short of 26 years. <laughs> um, when I was a new legislator in 1997, I started looking around the Capitol while I was waiting for meetings. I soon noticed there were no statues or busts of blacks from Minnesota. Then I noticed there were none of women. Then I noticed there were none of workers or union leaders or educators or farmers, basically politicians mostly. And I thought to myself, how do the people of Minnesota relate to the people honored in the Capitol. What we really need here is a real role model. And I thought about who we could have busts or statues of. I immediately thought of Nellie as clearly the leading civil rights leader. And as I started thinking of others to represent a variety of people, I realized Nellie was sort of an all-in-one. She had done a great amount of work for women in the workplace, she was known all over the state for her fiery oratory and accomplishments for workers and union rights. And she was a leader on both college for all as well as job training. And on top of everything, she always still remembered she was a farm girl and fought for them. So I introduced a bill for a bus for Nellie. After I talked to two powerful ironing legislators, they really liked the backing that she had always done for the unions and being a union leader. And the bill sailed through the House and all the committees in, in the Senate, but at the last minute it was blocked in the Senate. But I wasn't going to give up, as you can see. Um, finally, I kept trying and trying, and in 2014 uh, budget year, 18 years later, I got cooperation from both houses and the governor. And what, we got what is believed to be the first law in the country to put a statue of a black woman in the state capitol. Thank you. And the reason I asked Senator Lance to author the bill in the Senate is, as usual, Nellie had a lot of connections. She had told me long, many years before that Ron Latz's grandfather and his dad were political close friends of hers and were in the same group on the north side political fights as she was way back in the 50s, etc., 40s, 30s. <laughs> and a big selling point to legislators was my convincing them that a statue along with a big plaque setting forth all Nellie had done would be a great role model effect on everyone, but especially students and within students, especially women and those of color. 
Then we had to raise the money for the statue. Thank God for the unions. They understood how important it is for working people and students to come to the Capitol and be inspired by seeing someone like them. The unions contributed by far the most money. And who was the leader on that? Right there, Louise was a, did a great job on getting all the union money. And so now we have the fa fifth statue of a real person and the first real person statue since around 1914. So think about that, it's over 100 years. Um, when I think about Nellie, I think about what an incredible life she had. One of the first indicators are actual conversations I've had with staff at her nursing home. I'll never forget this the first time it happened to me there. It had, been, it had happened earlier at 314 Hennepin and other places she lived and different ones. But one evening when I was visiting Nellie at the nursing home, some of the staff were gathered and one said to me, you know, Joe, that old woman you're always visiting has the wildest imagination. She tells all sorts of obviously false tales about herself, <laughs> being involved with a lot of the most powerful people in our state and nationally, and about getting all sorts of things done for minorities and women and workers and for better education. To top it off, what's even more amazing, Joe, is she says it the same way every time, never changing details. And that's really tough when you're making things up. <laughs> And I said, well, if you look at everything she was involved with and accomplished, you would have a good argument for calling her the woman of the century in Minnesota. And I asked what they were talking about. So the first woman said, well, Nellie claimed she was a close friend of two vice presidents of the United States, Humphrey and Mondale. And she claimed she worked closely with them on legislation and helped get Humphrey elected. How ridiculous is that? <laughs> <laughs> and she even tells stories claiming she went around Africa with Mondale. So I said to them, you know something? That's all true. Um, when Humphrey first knew I was from the north side of Minneapolis, this is Hubert, not Skip, <laughs> back in 1971, he immediately started talking about his great friend from the north side, and how Nellie, and how she helped him learn civil rights, workers, and union issues and how she helped him get support from the unions and from blacks. His son, Skip, right here, who was our attorney general, will be up here next to tell you more. And Mondale, whenever I asked for something for him, for help for Nellie or one of her programs, like her scholarship, he said, I'll do anything for Nellie. And she helped, she, he said she helped him on civil rights and voting issues. And yes, she did accompany him in Africa on his goodwill tour. And he told me that at all times, she, not his wife, but Nellie stood next to him and sat next to him at every meeting and every dinner and ceremony. And of course, I told them that she was also a friend of Governor Perpich. And then someone at the nursing home said, well, she surely didn't know Jackie Robinson and some big union leader from the East Coast who organized the March on Washington with Martin Luther King. So I informed them, uh, yeah, she did know both of them. <laughs> and she didn't like Jackie personally. She thought he was arrogant and stuck on himself. But she thought he was doing fantastic work for people. And the union leader, of course, was A. Philip Randolph, a black man who was head of the Porter's Union and was the originator of what's called the Martin Luther King March on Washington. Nellie said that A. Philip Randolph was not only great and powerful, but was gracious to women and treated them as equals. And if you've studied the civil rights movement, there's a number of the great leaders, the men that had the reputation of keeping women in the background. <laughs> and so A. Philip Randolph was completely the opposite. So then I went on to tell the people at the nursing home a short brief of what she had done. Um, like I said, it would take hours to cover everything that she did. 
But I talked to the people there at the nursing home about her slogan, what all people need is an equal opportunity to a good education, a good job, and why she fitted everything into that. And people mostly don't know. She was the most, one most responsible for getting Minneapolis to pass the first in the nation fair employment ordinance, and then later the fair housing ordinance, and later they were passed similar laws for the whole state and the Minneapolis Civil Rights Commission and the Department of Human Rights came out of these. When she was working at the athletic club in Minneapolis, she faced both job discrimination because she was black and cutting wages for all their employers. People probably don't know, but her dad was an organizer for the Milk Producers Association of Minnesota when she was on his farm. So she understood the power of organize. Her dad taught her well. So she decided to help organize the union at the MAG. She quickly rose within the union to be one of the first women vice presidents and contract negotiators. And then she became a force at the Central Labor Union and pushed through positions demanding the end to discrimination against blacks and women. And the first resolution was for the Minneapolis School Board to do that. And that came out of the union movement before the NAACP or Urban League pushed it. Uh, eventually, she rose to being on the governing boards of the Central Labor Union and the state AFL-CIO. And she was, of course, a close friend at the time of three heads of the Minnesota AFL-CIO, as well as the one to become head next. Within the political realm, she also achieved great success. She was the first black person elected to Minneapolis government. Think about that. First person in history in Minneapolis. And she was in demand as an orator around the state for organized workers and for civil rights, as I mentioned, and a leader in the Farmer Labor Party. She and Hubert Humphrey, who was the leader of the Democratic Party, were close personal friends, even though they had the biggest fights and arguments that have probably ever existed in this world, but they were such close personal friends and believed in each other, they always worked it out. And the two of them got together, she was with the wing of the Farmer Labor Party that did not want to merge back then into the DFL, but Hubert got her to bring them in and so that's why we have the DFL party in Minnesota. She later rose to the executive committee of the DFL and became national committee woman for the Democratic Party. And she was instrumental in the party's black caucus. And what almost nobody knows is she was the Minnesota rep National Democratic Agriculture Committee. She never forgot her roots on the farm. And then, she never gave up. When she was in her mid-70s, she recruited and ran the campaign to elect the first black council member in Minneapolis. And of course, she was active in national civil rights and black organizations, and I won't go into all of that. She was on the executive board 26 years of the NAACP. Well, one thing that I think is of note is that she and a few other black union activists within the NAACP were constantly harping on Thurgood Marshall. As you all know, he was later a U.S. Supreme Court judge. They said he wasn't aggressive enough on handling discrimination and segregation cases, and he better get his butt going. Um, if you knew Nellie, that was easy for her to do. Um, and so, uh, in closing, it's impossible to remember all the vast number of initiatives Nellie led. But the most important thing for everyone to remember is her character. She had a deep-seated passion to help everyone in need, as she called it, a sense of humanity. And she wanted everyone treated alike. She hated racism and tribalism, no matter where it was coming from. And she couldn't stand dwelling on the past. She wanted all focus on the present and future, namely, how do we make everyone a success in life? She was proud also of the fact that she never stopped learning, even on issues where she had taken a leading position. She told me many times she had changed her mind on an issue, either because she gave a deeper consideration or learned new facts or concepts. And above all, she cared more about helping others than herself. 
Nelly turned down many lucrative jobs, including in the federal court system, because she wanted to contribute to her charge on helping humanity despite the fact it kept her at a low income. If she ran her own shop, she could take off whenever she wanted. She didn't have to answer to an employer on any of her union or, um, or political positions. I would say she's the personification of what a good citizen can accomplish. Almost all Minnesotans, no matter what their role is, can relate to her and strive to help others. And people, especially students, can read her story on the plaque and be inspired to follow in her footsteps. I'll always remember another thing about her at that nursing home. When I visited her in the nursing home one morning, she was too sick to even sit up. I told her that her union was picketing the new owners of the athletic club where she first got her started in the union. She leaned over, onto one, rolled over onto one elbow and said, you go down there and tell my union and brothers and sisters to give them hell for Nellie. <laughs> and that, that, that's just plain Nellie. And with that, I turn the mic over to Skip Humphrey, Hubert's son, who was our great attorney general and later the national head of the American Association of Retired Persons. Nellie and Hubert had enormous arguments, as I said, but they recognized the greatness in each other. And working to together, they accomplished tremendous things for Minnesotans. Skip. Thank you, Joe, the governor, lieutenant governor, and friends. It's uh, wonderful to be here. The story about Nellie is uh, just very special. Here is a woman who was able to do all those things, and if you were sitting next to her like I was on occasion on a bus, you were being told what to do next. I mean, it was a matter of, she had this sense of wholeness, of understanding of where we needed to go, but it was always, how are you going to get there? How are you going to make it happen? And uh, so it is indeed an honor to be here. I will attempt to uh, contain the Humphrey genes for long speeches. Um, my good friends that are here know that uh, I don't have the capacity that a certain other gentleman in our uh, family had. Uh, but let me just say a couple of things because I don't want to forget some of these things. This is a story, you've, you've heard what Nellie has done. If there's one word that I think fits her better than anything else, yes, she was able to protest, she was able to stand up and say, no, this isn't right, but there was always this other commitment. What are you going to do about it? How are you going to get it done? She was a doer. And if you look at the record that she has, that she accumulated, it was about getting the job done. And she helped drag this state and, frankly, this nation forward. We need more of that today. Um, Let me just tell you a couple of things. I was told by Joe four minutes, and I won't even make them four Humphrey minutes, okay? <laughs> I remember Nellie as almost my other political mother. She seemed to be always caring for me, and whatever activity concerned political ambition, political activity I was engaged in. And this was all throughout my political career from the time that I ran for state senate and served with Mr. Moe and others all the way through, and then after that too. And the same goes for Nellie's care and watching over my uh, wife, Lee. I can still see very clearly Nellie and Lee sitting in a bus chatting and organizing while we were on the road to one or another meeting event. She was always there. Yes, she had this larger aura about her, but it was always personal for her. 
She really was engaged with the individuals who she was dealing with at the time. Nellie just had that personal, engaging, caring sense and touch about her. Nellie, as, uh, as at the core of, she was at the core of transformation of Minnesota's path to a brighter and better racial history. And she did it through the hard work of her labor organizing labor action. If you look at all the organizations that she was involved with, you would say, well, wow, this woman is not only something, but she was a bit of a terror around. <laughs> but the thing is, she used those organizations and at the core of it was labor. She used it to make sure that working people had better conditions, a better life. That was her goal. And it was not only her personal goal, but it was the public goal that she had. And whenever those organizations seem to veer off, and you look at some of those organizations, you say, oh my goodness gracious, Communist Party, Socialist, this and all that. As soon as she sensed that things weren't going the direction that she knew they had to go, she was off on another tangent, organizing others to make sure that they were moving ahead in the right direction. And that really takes something uh, to do. Um, just a couple of other things. Uh, she wouldn't let you say no, that we can't do it. It was always something that she said, oh, I think you can find a way. Uh, that meant she was going to check up on you. She always had a persistent way to get the job and the better job done. Now, if my father were here today, uh, we would be here till tonight, but uh, dad would tell you uh, how uh, Nellie Stone Johnson was just as persistent with him as with any of us, and perhaps even more. And I think Joe mentioned it. If you see the parallel, and I, Joe, I gotta tell you, your words were really hit home. The fact was, they did have arguments, but it was arguments about how are we gonna do this better? How are we going to pull it together? Who do we need to have? How do we organize? And at the core of that, of course, was her involvement with labor and a knowledge also of farming and all of that. Uh, she was indeed a partner uh, with Dad in his quest for civil rights. And she was willing to stand up and say, no, nah, no, you need to go this way. Uh, she didn't have any problem telling him the, what the right direction was. She was a key player in the merging of the Farmer Labor, uh, Farmer Labor Party with the Democratic Party, as you have heard. And I love her history of joining whatever organization that would promote and help create a better working conditions for the working men and women of our state. And we've gone through that, whether it was FDR, she considered a hero, uh, Dad, Mondale, NAACP, Farmer Labor Party, Communist Party, Socialist Party, and on and on. Yet when it came to these organizations that didn't live up to Nellie's expectations, then she, her demand for real positive change kind of got into her. And she said, I've got to go another direction. I've got to do another thing. Nellie, you have been a worker, a supporter, and even more a friend and a mentor and a solid advisor to me and our Humphrey family. Thank you for your care. Thank you for your investment uh, of your good and kind service to our state and to our nation and to the world. world. Let me just say there's one word that comes to mind when I think of Nellie Stone Johnson and how she fits into the progress of our state. Reconciliation. She, she will expect us to acknowledge our past, to use it as a foundation for changing for a better future, and she will say, get on it, Humphrey, get on it, friends, get organized, get it working. Thank you, Skip. Uh, as you said, 
Uh, had it been uh, another uh, Humphrey that I was introducing it, we'd still be here uh, when the food was done. But thank you, thank you uh, for your powerful uh, statements. Now, uh, speaking of power, Dr. Tamrat Tademi is one of the uh, oldest best friends of uh, Nellie's and has probably done more in funding, in, in uh, touting, in teaching about Nellie of anybody in the state or nation. He teaches about Nellie in his classes at St. Cloud State University. He is a professor there, and he also spi uh, uh, inspires all of us to do more to recognize her and memorialize her. And so uh, will you share with uh, a couple of thoughts why you have put so much in? Oops. <laughs> I am the type of individual that doesn't like being pegged to a, a, a lectern. I like to move around. Say la vie, that won't happen now. And I have lost my voice. Uh, I was wearing my mask, and my sister here said, don't do that, please, because you don't look good. It was, it was a mask on. <laughs> so I had to listen to my sister. First of all, I want to be, tell everybody how proud I am to have been on the same planet as Nellie Stone Johnson. I also want to express my deepest condolences to my sister, the Lieutenant Governor, because I lost my mom and it's very painful. Now, let's see if I can compose myself. But anyway, um, to me, what does Nellie mean? Nellie means love. Nelly, Nelly means multidimensional brilliance. Nelly means organic brilliance, not a brilliance that you read a and artificially produce out of a book. She had a sense of humanness that could only come out of where she came from. Her beautiful father, William Allen, and his, her mother, the Allens, that family is a fantastic family and an inspiring one. William Allen was a 21st century human being, and so is Nelly. I want to make a slight correction. She's not only a person of the 20th century, because most of the issues we are struggling with right now were what Nelly was talking about. Whether it's employment, whether it's racial justice, police, whatever, the terror we feel, the incompleteness we feel, everything was right here with us. So with Nelly, there's always a call a call for emancipation, a call to do better. So I hope my beautiful brother, all right, the governor, my beautiful sister, and all of you sisters and brothers here, I hope you listen to N Nelly's call. I hope you don't shelf her in a statue there and leave it there. We have to listen to a call to do better for this state. I don't want this to be a ritual, which is why I did what I could, thanks to the folks in St. Cloud. And I had a, an amazing president, may he rest in peace, by the name Robert Bess. And by the way, talking about St. Cloud, I want to shout out to the, my sisters and brothers from St. Cloud. There's a brother here by the name Shazad Ahmad, she used to call, Nelly used to call him her Pakistani son. And Frank Vigiano was her, was her Italian son. <laughs> and by the way, the reason why I was able to raise all this money is because I have a loving, beautiful family. My partner, Karen Shannon, who had to go to the doctors. This is a crazy time, as you know. And she couldn't come. I would never have been able to do what I could for raising this money without the support of my family. Nothing is individually driven, it's collected. And yes, I am dedicated to Nelly. Yes, I've raised money, but that would never have been possible if it wasn't for the loving family I had. Nelly Stone Johnson was a household name. We got so close. How did we get to become close? Obviously, again, not through nonsense, not through tiki-taki nonsense. Nelly is not a tiki-taki nonsense person. 
But Nelly and I used to joke about, I used to wear, I was crazy about ber berets. In fact, I brought it here, but I don't want to take too much time. I used to wear ber berets. I can barely speak berets, as you know, the beret, chapeau, all right? And, and, and I used to wear the le leather berets. And my family used to laugh at me because I was sleep on the couch with my leather ber beret on. That's how maniacal I was with my berets. So Lenny and Nelly and I used to go shopping. She loved berets. And I would say, Nelly, let's go and get some berets. And I say, why don't you get a leather one like me so that we can both look cute? And she would say, no, that's too bougie for me. I want, I want the wool, woolen cob beret. And she got that. And anyway, she was so special. So we'd get all that stuff, we'd laugh with each other. And then I started to realize the magic she had on people. Be what happened is, with Robert Bays, we were able to give her a doctorate, an honorary doctorate with letters of humanities. Nelly got an, in 1996 from St. Cloud State. She shared that honor with the great Walter Mandel, the late Walter Mandel, who was the ambassador to the United States at that time. Both of them got an honorary doctorate in humanities with letters from St. Cloud State. St. Cloud State loved Nelly. Nelly brought, Nelly brought emancipation and healing to many of us. We started fighting for racial justice in the early 90s. Nelly would show up all the time to empower us, to heal us, to encourage us. And Nelly was definitely an amazing human being. One last thing I wanted to say, just to tell you how much people loved her. The day I found out that Nelly passed away and I used to walk around Lake of the Isles to ease from my stress from St. Cloud State. Anyway, uh, and don't get me wrong, there are a lot of good people also at St. Cloud State. Anyway, and Shazad being one of them. Anyway, so uh, here it is. I was walking around Lake of the Isles and I get a call. Nelly just transitioned. Nelly just passed from Judy or somebody because we're very close. So I told, I, as I was walking around the, uh, the, the lake, Walter Mandel used to love walking around Lake of the Isles. In fact, I used to walk around with him. He had a, he had a dog called Nietzsche. Nietzsche was his dog. He could almost make a comedy. Tamrat, Nietzsche, and Walter. <laughs> Any, anyway, so I would love walking around with Nietzsche and him. He taught me a lot, the, the great vice president of ours. And I told Walter, the, Fritz, as we used to love him and say, uh, brother, Nelly just transitioned and her celebration is going to be at the cathedral, the Breck School Cathedral tomorrow. He said, Brother Tamra, I'll be there. And he was. He was in the front seat together with Bernie Brammer, the great union leader president, and the other union leader. We sang Solidarity Forever. We cried together. Mark Dayton was there. Paul Wellstone was there. And my brother Skip was there. And just one last thing, I know, before I get dragged out, I'm, I'm talking forever too. Uh, uh, my brother, my brother uh, Walter got up, the Honorable Walter Mandel got up to speak. And he said, when he was in Africa with Nelly, he didn't know by the time she finished what was happening in Nigeria. Automatically, Nelly understood the contradiction of Nigerian society, the skewed wealth at the top and the poverty. She said she would get into meetings and she would pound the table. She thought she was going to recruit all the Nigerians to the, to the DFL party. <laughs> that's, how, that's how brilliant she was. Anyway, I love you all. I'm going to do all I can so long as I'm alive to do what, what is real for Nelly. And all of us in this room, we should pledge not only to celebrate her statue, but to do what is right for our community. I love you all. Do what's right for education, Governor. Thank you. I